Coming up tonight on Game All Night, I'm joined by Scott King. Quick programming note, tonight I don't have Dan because he's on vacation. So Scott and I just had a nice long conversation. So no, there's no game on this one because I kind of missed my game master. But don't worry, Dan will be back soon. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. This episode is brought to you by GameToppersLLC.com. Upgrade your gaming experience. Welcome to Game All Night. Well, hello and welcome to yet another Game All Night. Tonight, I am going to be joined by Mr. Scott King. There you are, Mr. King. So, Howdy. Scott has uh, been around the hobby for quite a while. Um, I think most people know you for your board game photography. Am I right? Probably. Right. So Scott King does all the calendars that kind of go around. And we know a lot of media folk who actually do those uh, and participate in them. And we'll get into that more a little bit later, too, I'm sure. So how are you doing today, Mr. Scott? I'm good. It's a Thursday and I have a coffee and I am just pretty happy. Yeah, I I went right for the scotch because, you know, it's that kind of day. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, peop, like I said, people know you for the artwork you do. Um, you kind of popped up on my radar for that because I also consider myself a photographer. I actually get paid occasionally. Um, but you also do a numerous amounts of other things on top of so, so let's recap your month. As far as I know, just following you. So mm-hmm. you you wrote and released, you had some book releases happen. You moved to Pittsburgh and you just launched your next calendar Kickstarter. That's more like from November till now. Okay, so <laughs> a little bit longer, <laughs> but it feels like it, it seems very compacted. I'm sure that that time flew by. So... Well, let's start with Pittsburgh first. Why Pittsburgh? Okay. Uh, my wife is a chemical engineer. She works for a global company. And they okay. kind of told her last September, hey, we need you at this plant. Will you go there? She kind of made a whatever offer and they randomly accepted the whatever offer. So now we're here. <laughs> so what do you think? I, I've been to Pittsburgh several times. Uh, I used to work for a company that's based out there. It's It's five hours away. It's not exactly close. But what do you think of the town so far? It's different from what we expected. Uh, I, I guess okay. I, I grew up in, in D.C. and Ocean City, Maryland. Right. And I kind of thought we were moving to Pennsylvania, but this is very much Western Pennsylvania. This is right. more, I guess, Midwest than East Coast. So it's just different culture than what we expected. And it's it's fun being able to not just explore the Pittsburgh area, but then Ohio or we went to Michigan for a weekend. We went to Chicago right. for the first time. So getting all that kind of stuff in, too, is, is nice. Right. Um It's funny because people think, oh, Pittsburgh, it's just Western state. And you don't really realize, too, that where it is, like I used to work there and people would commute from West Virginia into Pittsburgh to work Mm -hmm. because it's that close. And I think, you know, sometimes even us Pennsylvanians forget about that half of the state. As soon as the as soon as the turnpike starts to make turns, we kind of forget it. We think that's already in the Midwest. So but. It's a fun town. I think it's uh, it's great. It's got got a great restaurant scene, too. Have you guys had a chance to explore that yet? Uh, we've had lots of pierogies because pierogies are really popular in Pittsburgh. <laughs> That's good to know. Good to know. I haven't uh, I haven't actually tried that yet, but, you know, it was a Mexican restaurant chain I was working for at the time. So <laughs> it's a little, a little hard to say. Um, Mad Mex is actually based out of Pittsburgh and they have several restaurants. So they're a little plug for them. There was good food, good Mexican food if you ever want to try it. And some of the, probably my, my top three meal I've ever had in my life was actually in Pittsburgh. Where? So I know, right? You wouldn't think. So working for that restaurant company, he owns a few other big burrito. They own a few restaurants around the area. And one of them is called Umi, and it's above Soba. I believe it's Soba, um, which is in, it's down on Shady Side. But it's Mm. um, one of the best Japanese sushi restaurants 
you'll ever have. It was absolutely amazing. The, um, the Omatase course and everything was just second to none. So you have a great special occasion and you like sushi, that's your jam. And it's close. Depends. No, I, I just literally copied and pasted the website and emailed it to myself so we can go. <laughs> it's it's well worth it. I don't easily like hype things, but that one, if you're ever in Pittsburgh, I mean, it was a small fortune. Don't get me wrong, but it was amazing. Amazing. Hmm. And, you know, they really make a good job of of walking you through the different courses and the, the pacing of the. I can go on and on, but apparently they like stole a chef away from New York City and he was one of the top rated chefs. He usually takes like the month of July and goes home. Um, it's it's a very interesting setup. It's very cool though. At the same scandal time. and drama. I so, know. Awesome. So you're enjoying your time there. You moved. Um, I guess the latter part of last year. You got that all set. Uh, yeah. Up. It was like August. Hurricane Harvey hit us in Houston. We found out. She actually got the phone call where they asked her to move while we were landlocked and couldn't evacuate because <laughs> of flooding. Holy cow! And they were like, "Hey, come to Pittsburgh." And we're like don't bother us right now. We're dealing with hurricane. Leave me alone for a week. And then yeah. we, we bought a house. We took the job. We moved. And it was just, it was really fast. So when Harvey hit, that was right on your, your doorstep practically then. Yeah. And where we were, the way it works is, is the floodwaters kind of hit Houston. And then right. they all soak into the bays and rivers. And it took about a week for them to come south to where we were. So even though the hurricane had passed, moved on, and it was, you know, in the Atlantic by that point. Right. We were just then getting flooded. So it was it was pretty crazy. So you just when you think it's safe to go outside, it's like here comes all the water through the floodplain and out the delta right that way. Wow. Never would suspect these things at all. So yeah, it was it was it was wild. Wow. The amazing. I had no idea. For some reason, I thought you were in D.C. prior, but now I remember Houston. Well, I grew up in D.C. Gotcha. So maybe that's where you get confused. That might be. That might be. I get confused often. It happens. That's why I drink. It makes it look socially acceptable. <laughs> so you also are an author. Now, mm -hmm. would you consider this? Well, not consider. Is this your primary career? Is this what you do for a living? Is right or... Is that what you're kind of finding, yeah, filling your time these days? Probably at this point, I'm probably more a full-time author than anything else. Okay. Uh, when we were living in Maryland before moving to Texas, I was a college professor. Okay. Uh, we, we got down to Texas about four years ago and we realized, oh, with her job, this is a kind of a temporary thing where we're going to have to move every two to three years. What right. what am I going to do? Because I can't do a tenure track. So I said, all right, I'm just going to go all in on, on writing and, and game photography. Okay. Um, at first, the, the game photography, so publishers would send me games. I would take the photos, and it's the photos you see like on Amazon or they use for booths and that kind of stuff. Okay. And, and, and that picked up really fast, while the kind of author thing was, was a little more subtle. But in the past year, the books have just been selling so much more that I've been cutting back on the game photography. Wow. So, so basically, you're supporting yourself. You're working from home. That's got to be nice, right? But at the same yeah. time, a little stressful because you have all these needs to kind of, you know, get things done and move along. I could never work from home because I would I'd never get anything done. I'd end up surfing the whole time and it would just be ridiculous. So what kind of writing are you doing these days then that you've been able to now get published? I know you recently went on a tour when I reached out to you the first time to at least do a couple signings and launches for the book, right? Uh, no, I've not, I've never done a tour before. I don't know. Not, I think you're getting confusing. Tour. It's too much scotch. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I consider a book signing that you had to drive more than half an hour. We'll call that a tour. How's that? It, it, you might, there might've been the Nebulas conference because they have a, a big author event at the Nebulas and I was one of okay. the authors there this year. So it might've been that, or it might've been, if this was back in March when I launched my new fantasy series, right. I was doing dozens of podcasts. So it might have been like a podcast tour and not a physical one. That's it. Because I do remember you saying like you felt like you were on tour a lot. And I guess if you were just mm. walking through. Now, those were all obviously writing related podcasts and things like that because, you know, or science fiction. Where would you say those kind of podcasts? So if people want to hear you from other things, where would they find you on those? 
I, a lot of the, the actually author podcasts because I okay. was also launching a new nonfiction book about writing. Oh, wow. And so I was doing a lot of that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's that's a lot of it's a lot of wheels going on at the same time. I mean, you're, you're... I, I'm all over, but I, <laughs> I do try to tie it somewhat together. So, for example, the, the new fantasy series, uh, the first book is called Wrath of Dragons. It is traditional okay. second world fantasy. It's got a magician's apprentice. It's got a runaway princess. It's got a rogue dragon. It, it's very like fantasy fantasy, but with my kind of humor. OK. In addition to publishing that when I did, I also wrote a second book called Outline Your Novel. And it's okay. it's a third book in my nonfiction series about writing. And what I do in that book is actually break down and show how I outlined Wrath of Dragons, taking it from the basic concept and pitch to, you know, the next step would be, okay, what's the structure of it? What would right. then be the scene breakdown and, and all the way through from start to finish. So I, I published them at the same time because they were tied together. Makes sense. So am, am I, I do, I'm tired of making assumptions because every one of them has been wrong so far, <laughs> but mm -hmm. um, did you teach writing or, you know, parts of the English language at all while you were in a professor? Is that where this comes from? Uh, I went to school primarily focused for film production okay. and, and screenwriting. When I chose to go more teaching as opposed to moving to LA, because my father was, was really sick when I was a teen and when I was okay. in college, I, I kind of shifted over and really buckled down when I got my MFA in writing. And so when I was teaching, mm -hmm. I was teaching a lot of digital production classes, photography classes, uh, comic book scripting classes, and screenplay classes. Okay, so wow, that's that's kind of everything you need to kind of make the production happen and things like that. So you're just trying to, you know, gather all those resources into one place. Do you find that trying to teach photography in school is more technical or is it more on the creative and the results oriented side? It, it's both because you can't have the results without first teaching the technical. Okay. So my approach was always very much like this is kind of how you do it. And in, in many ways, photography is like painting or it's like writing in the sense that you have certain tools to use as a creator. Mm -hmm. And then what you bring as an individual is, is your voice. It's, it's your vision. And so I did my best to try to help my students figure out whatever that voice was in their photography. Right. And I think, you know, that's that's kind of yeah, that makes sense because it's it's a lot of everybody can take snapshots now because we all have cameras in our pocket, but mm -hmm. who's actually creating a shot? And I think that that's the huge difference between, you know, this photojournalistic style that we all do these days versus, you know, staged and planned photography that professionals do, right? Because that's really what you're hiring people for is knowledge and things like that. Interesting. So to three books on writing and then you launched a fantasy series that's traditional. So where do you see like the future writer Scott going in these kind of worlds? Are you trying to set out to are you going to be the next Jordan and write, you know, the Wheel of Time again? Or are you looking to be more of a trilogy writer? What do you think is your kind of vibe and feel on that? I, I am very much what the indie authors refer to as a, as a dirty genre hopper because I, I am all <laughs> over the place. I have uh, middle grade books. I have a choose your own adventure book. I have a oh, book wow. that's like half recipes and short stories that you can't even <laughs> classify as a genre. I have a political thriller. Uh, the fantasy series, it's it's book one of nine. Okay. Um, in, in addition to the main series, between each of the main books, I'm releasing a book of short stories that's tied to the world. Uh, I also have a dystopian thriller. Just two weeks ago, or a week and a half ago, I turned in short okay. stories that were all sci-fi to my editor. So so I, I am all over, and I kind of write whatever it is I feel and want to write. Um, it's kind of once, once you get established in the community, mm -hmm. you know how to run ads, you know you already have a certain audience. You okay. can kind of make money on it no matter what. All right. Because let's say I spend $3,000 to produce a book, right? Okay. Well, it may take me, you know, X amount of months to make that back. But even in a worst case scenario, let's say it takes me two years to make it back because I own all the rights to the books. and I'm going to continue to sell them for years and years and years. Right. It's kind of evergreen money. It's just going to keep making money down the road. So, you know, a, a book I produced five, six years ago might have made its money back 
you know, five or six years ago. And it's <laughs> at this point, even if it only brings in a hundred dollars a month, that's still a hundred dollars a month. That's that's no extra work. Interesting. So it's more about kind of accumulating this work that will then just continue to generate the residual income for you like that. It's very much about, yeah, about having a, a back catalog that's that's there to kind of just keep churning and churning and churning. And when you have enough of it, you just end up with a full income. Yeah. And then you're James Patterson, who has more books than God sitting behind him right now. It's crazy. Well, he doesn't actually write his books. He he has a, a team and he runs his novels like a, like a staff for a TV show. So he's kind of okay. like the lead writer and he brings in other people to, to, to plot out and, and write the actual books with him. Do you think that's that's... I've been noticing that that's definitely a trend, and I think I first really noticed it with um, Tom Clancy back, you know, when he would start to write, and then he would kind of, you know, you felt like he wrote his original books, and then they kind of started to change a little bit, and you see that these very prolific authors, like how's Clive Cussler putting out, you know, four books a year, but it's, I guess it's more of a workshop method and a studio method than it is one guy sitting at a keyboard punching away. It just depends. Um, for traditional publishing, there there is a limit, not so much on what an author can write a year, right. but what the actual traditional publishers can publish. There There's limited shelf huh. space in Barnes & Noble. They can only put out so many books a month. Right. It's, it's why a lot of traditional authors are now switching to become hybrids. So they'll have X amount of books and series with the traditional publishers, and then on the side, they'll put their own stuff out because they literally write too fast for the publishers. You have a lot of traditional authors who they'll have pen names, but the pen names aren't there to keep anything secret. It's because, you know, with this pen name, they are now publishing YA with this publisher. But okay. with a different pen name, they're now publishing, you know, traditional fantasy with another publisher. And you can't use both names because it's competing and contracts and clauses and, and all that kind of crazy stuff. So the more prolific a writer is, it leans towards taking other routes. So writing, okay. you know, four books a year, if that's what Clive Cullors is doing, that that really isn't that big of a number. OK, I know. It, yeah. Gosh, I, I know romance authors who do a book a month, which is just <laughs> just crazy. That's that is that's completely insane to me, because, I mean, we talk about like what, NaNoWriMo, where people are trying to get off the horse and write a book in a month in October, typically, if I'm not mistaken. And I'm November. Like, November, it just seems absolutely crazy to me. Do you participate in that at all? No, but about two years ago, I wrote a whole novel in five days. And then I wrote a book <laughs> about that called The Five Day Novel. So, yeah, that's smart. Double dip, right? Right on the experience mm -hmm. that you just made yourself have. Makes sense. Well, it's, it's also <laughs> from, from the classroom as a student. You learn very much from not just the lectures, but from the questions the other students are, are asking or from the, the input and the feedback other students are asking. Okay. And you don't really get that when you try to read a, a nonfiction book. And so one mm -hmm. of the things I try to do with, with my nonfiction is is use the examples of my own writing. Like, okay, here's, here's this thing I'm working on. Here's all the stupid broken stuff with it. Here's how I'm going to try to fix it. And sometimes I do fix it and sometimes I don't. But through that process, a reader can kind of learn from my mistakes at the same time. Interesting. So even though you kind of stepped out of teaching, you still have the teaching bug and you still want to get oh. your knowledge out there. Absolutely. Right. I, I miss it because as a creator, you definitely grow from from working and interacting with students. Sure. And, and yeah, like you said, this is kind of like my way of, of scratching that itch. It's, it's that way of getting that bug of, of reaching out and connecting with people. Interesting. I never had no idea. Never had no. I didn't have any idea that there was so much involved with you know, the publishing house and how many different steps and levels. Um, what do you, how do you navigate like the whole, you know, from, I mean, we can go on Amazon and publish a book and call it done, but where's the traditional publishing route? How does that navigate and how do you manage to get through that? It's, it's pretty much the same as it's been. The only real difference now is, is how you get into it. So generally it's, it's, you need an agent, and then agent has to take whatever project you're trying to sell and, and sell it to a publisher. Uh, right. You sell whatever rights the, the publisher wants and that you agree to sell. And then you don't touch it again from that point on. The, the publisher does everything else and you generally have no input at all. Um, if there is an editorial pass at demand or things like that, you might end right. up working one-on-one -on -one with an editor in that case. But, but generally it's, it's hands off and 
the contract says, okay, you know, you have, we're, we're taking this book, we're going to publish it in X amount of time, two, three years down the road, and you aren't allowed to sell or s competitive stuff in the same genre or whatever. Interesting. So how do they handle the fact that you self-proclaim like to genre hop so much and go around? Like, how does that work? Because to me, it seems like, well, there are publishers who specialize in different styles of books and you know tour wants to specialize in fantasy and you know you have some more or is it becoming more you know more gray and opaque across the board my my nonfiction and my just regular fiction are all indie published it's actually my my graphic novels that are traditionally published okay so everything else you do indie so what's the indie road is mm -hmm. that just like you basically do self-publishing service put it up and people come and find it uh, what do you mean? Well, so the Amazon model would be you upload it, it goes through, mm -hmm. and then it, it's a print-on-demand style. Whereas, how does the other indie publishing go? Do you just try to seek out a publishing house and just say, hey, I have this book without going through an editor or an agent? Or how does that work? Oh, I, I hire a cover artist to okay. draw the art for it. I hover, hire a, a graphic designer to do the text layout. I hire an editor to do the copy edits. I hire oh, wow. a proofreader okay. to do the the proofing. I use beta readers to double check that proofing. Um, I skimp and I do the formatting myself because there's a, a few programs and, and I'm technically savvy. Okay. I upload it to, to Amazon and so forth. I publish it. I run the Facebook ads, run the Amazon ads. I run the BookBub ads. I do all the promos and all that kind of marketing. Wow. So you you really are doing everything the traditional publishing house does. You're just doing it on your own. So it's not mm -hmm. like you're shortcutting anything and just kind of putting up a PDF like we might think. It's you're going through all those steps and you're still editing, proofreading. You have blind testing, you know, almost almost like publishing a game, I guess. It's why similar yeah. terminology exists. Interesting. Interesting. So why don't we take a quick break? Let's pause and then I want to come back and then we can get into the photography because you did just launch a Kickstarter. I'm usually not time relevant, but it kind of seems silly considering it was literally two days ago um, as we record this. So I think we should definitely talk about that. And I obviously want to get into, you know, talking about how you game and how you find time and how you find time in a new city. So we'll hit all those topics when we come back right after this. For those of you who follow me on Twitter, and if you don't, why don't you? Well, maybe you don't like Twitter? Well, I'm on Facebook too, because not only are they donating a quiver, we are also getting sponsors to put games that go in a quiver. I believe Bruce said he's gonna give me a happy salmon. That's gonna be awesome, right? Get out of here. I also talked to my good friend, Alan Girding who's going to throw in a copy of World Championship Russian Roulette, one of the best party games i played in a really long time. And play from Capstone Games, who also said he'd donate Carthago. I mean, come on, how awesome is this? This fits in a quiver, too. And then last but not least is Chris Kirkman of Dice Hate Me Games and Greater Than Games. And he's going to give me a copy of Isle of Trains to throw in here as well. Maybe I'll put one right here. So you can see what it is. Yes, we're going to do a raffle, but the raffle is going to be a share here, like here, put this on Twitter, put this on Facebook. It's going to be one of those. You're going to have to jump through a few hoops, but come on, you're getting like four games and the quiver, the quiver, the quiver's awesome. Enter at gameallnightshow.com slash contest. All right. Well, welcome back. I'm still here with Scott King, author, board game photographer, teacher, instructor, professor, husband, husband? Podcaster. Podcaster, yes. So what podcast do you do, sir? I have to I have to admit, I'm not really sure. I do the Creators Cast. It's a podcast where I have authors, photographers, game designers, artists, people who just create stuff. They, they come on okay. and we just talk about making stuff. Okay, that's pretty awesome. I'm gonna have to add that to my list. So what's been, let's call it your most uh, interesting episode? What's the one that kind of jumped out at you? Me personally or just in general? No, you personally, because I think, you know, this is a personal business and sometimes we, we put a lot out there, right? 
So I I really enjoy the episodes I record with uh, Eric somewhere from the Dice Tower. Okay. Uh, Eric is my voice narrator on a lot of my audiobooks. Oh, wow. And we just have a good rapport. So it was really fun just having Eric on and goofing off for the episode. <laughs> so that if you listen to episode, I think 100 was his most recent one. And and we just, just again, we're just goofing off, having fun. Awesome. So does does he call you when he can't pronounce things and say, Scott, what's this word? I, I don't know this one. It generally works is that he'll I send him a, a Mobi file or okay. I think I think I send him an EPUB file. He, he reads it. He marks it up. And then we have like a 30 minute phone call of, OK, I don't know how to say these words. How do you want these other words pronounced? This is the traditional way. This is the way you probably say it here in America. What do you want these characters to sound like? And that kind of stuff. Really interesting. So once mm -hmm. again, turning around and becoming the full publisher and even outsourcing your own audiobooks as well. <laughs> Well, you, you want the quality of what you produce to, to be of high quality. I right. I am intelligent. I have certain skills. I can take photos. I can write. I, I will never be a, a voice narrator. So it makes sense for me to hire someone who does that professionally, who knows the ins and outs, who can do better voices than I ever could, who has experience doing it. You know, it's funny. I um, So I, I do listen to podcasts and every now and then I kind of get kind of get tired of it because it's, you know, it's, it's a lot of information all the time and a lot of opinion. And sometimes I just want to sit back. Like I have a ride coming up to Maine here. That's going to be a nine hour run. That's audiobook territory. You know, I'm mm -hmm. definitely throwing one in and I understand because there are literally times where I will be like, what has this narrator read? Like, because he tends to read things I like and he reads in a way that I'm used to. So I like Scott Brick. He does all the Clive Cussler novels and, you know, so I'll start. Oh, yeah, he, he has a huge following also. Yeah. And it's, it's really amazing that, you know, you find these people who kind of also, you know, it's another way to find more books because I think that's a challenge, right? When we're out there and we're I'll burn through a series and I'll be like, OK, well, now what? because we don't know what the next book is and Goodread helps, but Goodreads only goes so far, right? So interesting. So you talk with Eric, you have that. So they've been a lot of fun. So what has been the, um, what has kind of been the motivation for doing the creator podcast? I mean, if you've done a hundred episodes, you've done a lot. I mean, that's, that's definitely a lot of time. It's mostly just an excuse for me to talk to cool people. Like I don't, I don't monetize it. I don't really market it. I kind of just do it because I get to talk to cool people. I I can understand that. I'm I'm kind of doing that same thing myself. So it's definitely cool. So the other thing that you do monetize, however, is mm -hmm. you do the calendar. Now, before initially, like I didn't really think about it in terms of, oh, you know, you make a calendar, you put it up and then you send out 100, 200 copies and it's done. But when I actually went to look, this is not what you do at all. And what started as a, a small Kickstarter with, I, I want to say, what, 50 images in the first one that you gave options of? I think the very first year I did it, I just did it. There were no options. Okay. And then all of a sudden it's grown. And how many, you have like a ridiculous amount this year to build the calendar from. So the, the way I run the Kickstarter, just for anyone who doesn't know, is that I do a, a base calendar. Base mm -hmm. calendar means that the 12 months, I pick the photos that go in it, and you kind of just buy a copy like you would any other calendar. But like I also it. have another backer level called a custom calendar, where backers get to add four holidays, whatever they want to it. So, okay. you know, the anniversary, birthday, whatever. Uh, but they also get to pick the photos that go in their calendar. And so from the pool of photos they get to pick from, I have over 320 photos. Wow. And, and, and they're just games so many games <laughs> so i i have a feeling i i know the answer and it kind of scares me but has anybody ever just picked one image for all 12 uh the the classic reference i use for the person who picked one game for all 12s is viva java the coffee game the dice game i will not <laughs> name the person who might have picked a calendar that had every photo of that game but i'm sure you could figure it out Hmm. What, he wouldn't have a certain kind of musk and have been on my show two weeks ago, maybe. Maybe. I, I do not know, and I cannot <laughs> state. But the question is, do you have 12 pictures of Viva Java up there is the question. 
Uh, there's, there was only one. It was the same photo for <laughs> for every month. Okay, I can see that. Maybe it was just kind of a, a a present of of love that was made for somebody. You know. I do not judge what people <laughs> choose to have in their calendars or what random weird holidays people pick because people pick weird holidays, weird made up holidays. I do not judge if you know what they they're getting the calendar, they're putting it up. That makes me happy, and they can do whatever they want with it. So, so one has to ask, I mean, the, the board game photography market has always been very narrow and you think it's kind of like, well, why? But I'll tell you why, because I thought that would be a great idea to do. And I thought it would be a lot of fun, but then I, I set up my soft box and I was ready to go. And I'm, I'm like, I'm going to, you know, put my 1.8 lens on, which makes everything nice and bokeh and blurry. And then it, then you have to set it up. You have to set up the game. So it actually looks like it might be in progress if you're doing that kind of shot. And then you have to, well, pieces get dusty, believe me. Then you have angles, then everything's shiny and glary. <laughs> So it's it's not as simple as, you know, all the great shots that we take on our iPhone. What goes into one of your typical shots? Because yours are very deliberate shots. It's not like you're playing Takenoko and saying, this looks cool. Let's take a picture right now. It's There's definite planning and story even sometimes going on. There's there's probably two style of photography that that I use for doing my game photography. The, the the first is is very commercial. It's okay. I'm taking this for the client. I know this is going to go on Amazon or they're going to print it out for a booth and that they want okay. certain things. Um, in many cases, that means like just trying to pick a random game. Uh, let's say for example, Reef. It's it's one of the new games out this summer that's pretty hot. Uh, you right. take little reef looking things of coral and, and stack them on top of each other mm -hmm. so maybe for if i was doing a client shoot for reef i would want a shot of the board that's very bare and minimum with only one or two pieces on it and then i would want to follow that up with one that just has a few more added components so it's almost like a comic book panel where if a viewer looks at the two photos side by side they kind of make the mental jump of what happened in between the photos so you, like you said it's it's telling a narrative in the story Right. And, and that's yeah. And that's a very visual game. So, you know, it's you're trying I guess you're trying to connect the dot. Right. How did I a right. get to be? You're not just taking a picture of a game board with all looking the bits. For whatever the, the key element, whatever the star element, whatever makes that game, that game stand mm -hmm. out in those kind of photos. And then there's what I call just the more artsy me photos. And that's mostly what you see, like in the calendar. That's where I right. try to take a portrait of a game, just one photo that really tells the story of what, what this game is and what it's about. Um, the way I, I actually take those photos, it's it's probably a little bit more food photography-ish than right. any other photography genre. But but that's kind of like the, the, the two main styles that I go with. Yeah, I think that that's a great comparison because food photography, that's actually where I had to go this afternoon was to a food photography <laughs> studio and drop things off. <laughs> Wish I could have stayed and played, but it's it's one of those things that it, it's an enormous amount of setup and then just just to get that one shot and to tell you so you're you're taking a game and trying to tell the picture it's a complicated game something like takinoko even becomes very complicated when you try and take a picture of it to kind of give a feel for it right so how do you do it with something like if you were to do Lisboa or something big and crazy, like where the star might not be very obvious to me, it's the board, but I, I don't know what else might stand in that place. I think what a lot of people who aren't into photography don't realize is that most photos, even of something like a board game need to have a central focus. They need to have one okay. thing that is trying to get across, which, which you, you obviously know, and so what you need to do when you're, you're trying to decide how you're going to photograph this game is you need to figure out what that star is. So maybe in some cases the star is the board or maybe it's the one kind of figurine or, or whatever. But that's kind of a choice that you as a photographer have to decide and interpret from what you've seen 
people talk about the game what what you what kind of strikes you as just interesting about the game or or what really okay. stood out in the rule books or when you played hmm. interesting so if we were to impart a tip to all the cell phone photographers out there who we all know them, right? Because we struggle because we, we line up the board and we take a shot and it's, it, it doesn't come out the way we see it in our head, I guess is the best way to put it, right? Your, your mind is doing a lot of things that a camera just smart as it is, isn't doing. It can't tell you how to feel about a picture and everything. So I think pick a focus point is a good one. What do you think is another great piece of advice to that person who just wants to take better game photos because they like to Instagram all their games they're playing or they're that person? Probably the most important thing is, is lighting, is, is be aware of what your light sources are. Uh, if you're in a someone's dining room and it's a very yellowy light, just be aware that that yellow light is going to make your game look yellow. If you wanted a clean, brighter photo, you need to use daylight balance bulbs inside of your house if it's your own house. Or you need to take the photo in front of a window and not have the inside lights turned on. It's, it's such a small thing, but that weird color cast can drastically shape what a, what a photo is. And not having enough light can, can just ruin a photo. It'll make it come grainy or not out at all. Yeah, and don't even get us started on like old school fluorescence. I mean, at least the CFLs now are light balanced, but... Back in the day, oh man, old school fluorescent that like mom had at her house and shoved in that, oh, just not not pretty. But sometimes turn the kitchen light off because you might get more dramatic lighting coming from the side and coming from a window. And our cameras are so good now in the phone that they can take a good low light photo like that because we have the aperture and the depth that we can actually do that. So that's a great suggestion. I wouldn't have thought that. I, I would have been like... Well, go research the rule of thirds and try and keep it. No. <laughs> I'm, I'm more of a, I'm definitely more of a technical photographer sometimes. And I have to, I have to step back and I have to get, you kind of have to say, wait, photographers have two brains. If, if you, if you ask me, we have a technical brain and we have a creative brain. And sometimes one is running at full speed and the other one is playing catch up. And you just need to find a way to kind of get them closer to balance. And sometimes you have a vision of what you want and you just can't make it. So it's a matter of then, well, my technical isn't there. So it's a matter of getting those to kind of be together. I think is that's my biggest personal struggles. I go and it's very mechanical and I'm like, no, step back think about the process and trust the process when you're actually taking photos and things. Interesting. So how long does it take you? I, I got to know, how long does it take you to set up and do one of these shoots? Like if you it were depends to do... on the size of the game. Okay. Uh, you... I just shot pioneer days for, for Tasty menstrual. Okay. Uh, you got to figure I have to, to read the rule book. I then generally watch one or two videos online to make sure that I understood the rule book and see how people are generally setting it up. Mm -hmm. um, if, if I have time, I try to go ahead and play the game so I understand what the cool aspects of it are. And then the actual shoot itself could take anywhere between an hour to two hours for just a regular game. If it's something like I shot just for fun, I shot Food Chain Magnet, Magnate. <laughs> and, and, and that was like just so many pieces and trying to get them all lined up. And they're so small. That took probably an hour just to get one photo. Right. And so then, it just really just depends on the game. And then you also have the issue with, you know, let's take our Takinoko player versus our food chain player. That food chain player, myself, is going to notice when something is wrong. And wait, that can't be there, you know, and, and they'll nitpick <laughs> that and it'll be difficult. And it might not be that they're angry about it but it might just be a nag like a little brain nag that just kind of gets under their skin that they see this wrong for a month so you got to get it right to do the calendar but it's interesting right it, well and for, for the client work I, I put it all in a gallery so i'll turn in 30 50 whatever photos the, the right. publisher will look at it and they'll say oh scott i love these these are fantastic but you were supposed to use the green meeple not the blue meeple because the blue meeple is supposed to be for that part of the board and i'm like ah and then i just do reshoots Right. Which any photographer will tell you are the absolute worst. We want to get it right the first time. That's that's in our nature. Get it right in the camera 
we don't want to Photoshop it, believe, despite everybody's belief. We want to get it right the first time, get it right in camera and execute. That's, that's our nature, I think, because we don't want to sit in front of a computer. We want to sit out in front of a camera, right? <laughs> So it sounds to me like you kind of, so when I do weddings, I like to do a, um, an engagement shoot and I usually throw these in for free and everybody's like, well, why aren't you charging? And I'm like, it, it's an investment in the wedding because if I throw in the engagement shoot, I'm reading the rule book. I'm seeing where the bits go. We're doing a dry run. We're doing all those things so I can get to know the client and what they want so that when they have their wedding day, it's not, oh, well, this is very important. You know, her relationship with her father is huge. It came out this way versus, you know, something that you think is significant, but for them it's just like, whatever, this is every day. So it's, you need that dance to figure things out. And it sounds like you do the exact same thing. I wouldn't have thought that. I would have thought you just kind of look at the rule book, set up the game, put it out, maybe arrange the bits along the side of the board so it looks like players are playing and then kind of go. But now it, that speaks to the truism of what the final product is, right? I mean, it's, it, you're, you're basically taking a portrait. It's just that instead of food or a person or a location, it's a board game. And you need to know that board game to be able to really do it justice. Yeah, to tell the story of the game. Mm -hmm. So... All right, so let's let's ask the question then. What has been the best story that you've seen come through a board game when you've been working on the photos? And you can either your calendar or your personal. Like what kind of... I don't know. That's a weird question. I have no yeah. idea. Has there been one that just kind of stood out and it kind of was very obvious that these things... I mean, obviously the Panda and Takinoko is important. I keep using that one because it's very photogenic and obvious. But are there some other ones where maybe something kind of jumped out and really screamed that were the central thing and were the central element to it? I guess is where no, I'm it, going. It, it, it's, it's more like I will see a game and when I see a game and there's something unique or different, I'm just like, mm -hmm. ooh, I, I really want to photograph that. Uh, just last week, Matt Leacock tweeted out that they're doing the 10th anniversary of, of pandemic and it's like a hundred dollars and it's all fancy yeah. in a case. It's got figurines. And I immediately was like, I need to photograph <laughs> this. And so, so, you know, I pre-ordered it because I, I have to photograph it. So it's more like I see a game and whatever it is about it really jumps out. And that, that piece just speaks to me. And okay. so it's, it's, it's not something a lot of times I, I try to find. It's more like it's just there and it's obvious. And it's like, I have to photograph that one thing. So, so a publisher sending you an empty box for just a box photo is one thing, obviously. Name, most people use 3D renders these days any day. Anyhow, for something like that, you need the full game. You need to play it. You need the actual pieces. You can't really, can't really get by with prototypes and things like that when you're trying to do box art. How does the timing work on that? Because I imagine it's got to be a difficult because they're getting you pre-production pieces to try and get the cover done from the white box, maybe. I don't, that's gotta a, be A tough. lot of times what happens is a publisher will send me one of their airlifted copies from, from, from China. Okay. So once a game's been produced and they're all being shipped over by boat, they normally ship over X amount of copies by a plane. It's, it's, it's crazy expensive, but they get here, you know, months early. Right. That's normally the copy that I get. And it's, okay. it's with that is I, I take the photos and it's depending on the publisher. Sometimes they request I even mail it back. So then they go ahead and get it mailed back and they use it for demos or maybe get sent to a YouTuber so the YouTuber can make a video and so forth. Right. Interesting. So the stuff you do for them is more like promotional and it's more like print materials, the stuff you said in the booth and things like that. So. Interesting. Uh, I know a few of them also use them for sell sheets. So if okay. they are a company based in the U.S. trying to pitch their game and sell it to the German market or the Japanese market, they'll use my photos for the sell sheets. So when's the busy time? I mean, I want to say the obvious answer is like pre Gen Con, pre Essen, right? That makes sense. That, that's it. That's that's the busy time. It's it's pretty much June into July, which is always just just hectic, and then September. Okay. Interesting. So you're doing all this stuff. Do you find any time to game? And on top of moving, I, I'm how do you how do you find time to actually enjoy the hobby? Because I'm finding it's very difficult sometimes. 
Uh, I, I do like the board games. My my wife, Lisa, she's a comic engineer. She's a total geek in a good way. Awesome. And she actually loves games more than I do. So she is a big factor in, hey, let's play a game this weekend. And then it's my job to pick whatever game and learn all the rules and be able to teach her. Uh, so we, we play a lot of games together. We also have uh, friends in Cleveland. We've, we've now met up with them a few times. We're okay. going to a gaming event in, in Youngstown, which is like an hour away this weekend. And we're going to go play games at a board game store there. Uh, I've been invited to a few meetups in Pittsburgh. It's just they're at a weird time on a Friday night, which just normally isn't available to us. But I do mean to go to that at some point, too. So right. there's lots Thank of gaming you. here. It's just kind of finding where it is and, and, and where we fit into it. Right. And and traffic around Pittsburgh can be just like any major city. It can be a lot of work to get in and around sometimes. So getting into town is always tough. Did you um, know about WBC at all and what that is? Uh, World, World Board, Board Gaming Championship in Lancaster. It's on the calendar every year. But it's not in Lancaster anymore. It's in Seven it? Springs. Oh. oh, that's right. It moved. I forgot. Yeah. So it moved a lot more west. So while mm -hmm. I don't partake because it moved farther away from me, it's something. And actually, I believe it's going on this week as we speak. Um, it's something that's actually a lot closer to you nowadays so I, I, only, I have no idea where pennsylvania is other than like i know where philly and pittsburgh <laughs> i know nothing in the middle um well people who go there actually fly into pittsburgh um into the airport and seven springs it's a small um ski resort that's probably about 45 minutes to an hour west or east of pittsburgh it's not that far from you actually oh it's in the middle of nowhere wow yeah, well, that's the rub, right? Because it went from being Lancaster, which has a ton of stuff built up around it, to now being stuck like in a you go there, you stay there kind of area. And that's definitely one of the uh, issues. Oh, yeah, it's it's an hour and 40 minutes from my house. So that's that's the same distance as Cleveland. So that's not bad that's not at bad. all. No, it's um, but it's fun. And it's uh, it's a really good time. It's they do a lot of tournaments, but I never actually did that. I always just did open play when it was out here, and it was great. And it was relatively cheap. I mean, like 30 bucks a day cheap. And if you pre-buy mm. tickets, it's even less than that. So it's uh, if you get a chance maybe next year and you just get done your Gen Con rush and you want to relax, it would probably be a good thing for you to do. So, I mean, the other thing, uh, Washington, I guess, goes on the same weekend. So they do kind of compete a little bit. But... In the area. We, we did Origins this year, and I'm, I'm looking to, to have a booth next year at Gen Con. So oh, wow. that's like one of the benefits of being like more Midwest is, oh, these places are now drivable. Right. Yeah, I did uh, Origins this year. Too bad we didn't hook up. <laughs> I was just I was I was amazed. I was really loving how how nice Origins was. It was a great feel. Did you did you enjoy it? Yeah, it was interesting because when I was there, I guess five years ago, they had remodeled the convention center. And so okay. it plus the area around the convention center had been just, just reworked completely. And it was, it was really nice. Columbus is really nice. Yeah. I was, uh, I was very happy to the point where Sharon and I, my wife, we were going to do like some trips and kind of figure out what cons we want to do. And I'm kind of like, we did origins. We're like, we're good. This is it. We can drive <laughs> it. We can be there in seven hours and it's, Columbus was great. The food was great. You know, what's not to love? Open gaming happens. You know, gaming in the hotels. It's uh, it's all the things you want out of a con. Gen Con felt, Gen Con's more business, which, you know, would make sense if you're trying to reach out to publishers and things. That's a great place to meet, interact, and do more stuff. So it makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. So this has been a lot of fun, sir. I've uh, I've enjoyed getting to know you a little bit. This is definitely um, more than I bargained for. Here, you're not just a photographer <laughs> and part-time writer. It's it's so much more than that. And I hope our uh, our audience gets to know it. And we'll have to check out your podcast some more. So, if somebody wants to find you on the internet and in the areas, what's what's a good way to get that? If you're on Twitter, I am at Scott King on Twitter. If you're looking to check out my books, they're on Amazon. Just type in Scott King and they'll show up. If you're looking to listen to my podcast, it is The Creators Cast on Stitcher, iTunes, and wherever podcasts are listened to. And if you want to check out the 2019 Board Gaming Calendar Kickstarter, it is currently live on Kickstarter. And then post-Kickstarter, depending on when you're listening to us, 
you can always get a regular base calendar after the fact. Absolutely. And it's, uh, It'll be live at the time of this dropping. So, you know, I encourage everybody to go check that out. It's, uh, if for nothing else, look through the photos because guarantee there won't be a sum you won't want. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks for being on, Scott. This was a great time. I hope to have you back on in the future and we'll talk about what happens next. No, this is fun. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you for watching and be sure to have fun when you game all night. Game All Night is proud to be sponsored by Game Toppers. Check them out at GameToppersLLC.com. Upgrading your gaming experience. Well, that's a wrap. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed our efforts at comedy and fun, please support us on PodPledge. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And of course, don't forget to engage with us on Board Game Geek Guild 3134. You can also check us out on our website, GameAllNightShow.com. This show has been made possible through supporters like these. Angry Octopus.